can you hear me? I'm here, fighting, pressing to remember what you said. But this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again, that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles, past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters, quell the voices inside. Transform me, Lord, extinguish my pride. You've won the battle, I trust in your plans. Yes, God, I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. Good morning, Millican Church family. Welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, January the 16th. I'm really glad that you have come this morning to worship with us. We have been blessed so much by the Lord for how he's brought us through this week. We have so much to thank him for. I know that I do. I know that I've been a little bit under the weather and I'm very grateful to God that I am able to spend time with you today in worship. And so let's give God glory and praise that's due to his name. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, I just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here and we're glad that you are able to worship with us today and I hope that you will be blessed by our worship service that as you hear the word as you hear the songs and that as you hear from the scripture today that you will be encouraged to follow the Lord and that you will be encouraged to draw close to him as he draws near to you. Now, for those of you who weren't here last week, I just want to let you know that our staff is going to be taking a little bit of a break for the month of January. So our worship format looks a little bit different from how it has um, in previous weeks. But nevertheless, uh, we're still going to be sharing the word with you. Uh, we have some wonderful um, sermons that are going to um, be uh given to us and, and have been given to us by Kingswood University, which is the Wesleyan Church University, one of our Wesleyan Church Universities here um, in Canada. And uh, Dr. Stephen Elliott is going to be bringing the message and it's a powerful and such a food for thought message and reminding us that when we're going through things and when we feel that we're not gonna make it out, God is able to help us through. I would be, you know, a mess today, but God has brought me through uh, to be able to speak with you today. And so that is the message, but God, and I hope that you will remain to the end so that you be able to be edified in your spirit today. Now, before we continue, I have a, um, a few announcements for you, and I just wanted to share it with you. Um, first and foremost, uh, there will be no children's church this Sunday um, or for the month of January. So if you missed that message last week, there will be no children's church today. And so um, just wanted to let you know that 
uh, for the month of January. You have a little bit of a break, but we will resume in February. So just take that uh, time to mark off your calendars so that you are reminded that there will be no Children's Church for January, but join us in February. This Wednesday, January 19th, Bible study resumes, and so uh, there will be Bible study at 7.30 p.m. this week, and they're going to be studying a new book, which is uh, the Book of Romans. So if you are interested and you haven't already signed up but would like to receive the Zoom link, uh, please reach out to us. Um, just go to our website at www.millicanchurch.org slash contact or slash sign up, either one of those two, and you'll be directed uh, to the right people so that you can have the Zoom link to be a part of our Bible study. So please mark that in your calendars this Wednesday, January the 19th. Bible study starts at 7.30 p.m. Hope to see you there. Next Sunday will be our regular worship service at 10 a.m., so please join us for that. Invite a friend to join us, and remember that we have the mediums of Facebook um, online. Uh, we have our YouTube, ch um, also we have our YouTube channel, so you can either go on Facebook Live or our YouTube channel to be able to watch our worship services, and I hope that um, if you haven't already subscribed, that you will do so, that um, you'll be able to get notifications as to when our service begins and so that you'll never miss a moment. So just wanted to remind you of that. On Saturday, January the 29th, men's breakfast will resume and that will be happening at 9 a.m. So for those of you men who are interested, please remember to mark your calendars that there will be a men's breakfast on January the 29th at 9 a.m. A few upcoming events. So Time of Prayer is taking a break for January, but they will resume in February. So just stay tuned for the, the time and date. Uh, if you would like to sign up for our winter spring quarter, uh, once again, visit our website at www.millicanchurch.org slash sign up so that you can get the Zoom link for that. And our Millican youth will be resuming February the 3rd. So for those of you youth who would like to, are looking and anticipating joining back, uh, we will be starting back in February. Um, I just wanted to give you some time to um, get collected as I know that there's been a lot of changes for schools and I um, wanted to give you some time to readjust. So uh, we will be starting afresh in February on February the 3rd. So please mark your calendars for that. Well, this concludes all of our announcements for today. Let's open a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to where God would have us um, led today and that we will be fully engaged in following after him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you praise and glory for you are worthy to be praised. That alone, um, knowing that you are God, gives us so much to thank you for. And um, so we take this time now to do so. And Lord, as you prepare our hearts for the upcoming service, I pray that whatever we sing, whatever we hear, may we turn our eyes and fix it on you. And so fix our eyes are on you so that we may truly be able to be edified in our spirits and that we may be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Lord, I pray for each person who hears the word. I pray that you will help us to be more like you and that we will be encouraged to do exactly that, not just for today, but for the rest of our lives as we choose to follow you. Bless all that is going to be part of our worship service today. We thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. The splendor of a king 
clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in night, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, see with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hand. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. See with me how great is our See how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. See with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. My heart will see how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will see how great is our God. How great is our God, see with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 26, and it reads, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? he inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. 
Shortly after Helen and I got married, I said to her one day, I think it was a Saturday morning, I said, let's go for a drive in the car. So we jumped in the car and we headed out of town. We drove out the highway about 20 minutes or so and we left the highway, turned right onto a side road and went up there a number of miles and then I turned onto an even smaller side road and uh, as we arrived at the destination that I was taking her, uh, with a bit of a flurry of my hand, I said, what do you think? And Helen said, what do I think about what? And I said, that property right there. I said, what do you think about the idea that we buy that piece of property and that uh, we build a house at that, that location? And she looked at the property and she looked back at me and she looked at the property and she said, but there's a barn there. And I said, well, yeah, I know that there's a barn there. I said, but, but imagine a house there. And she said, but there's a barn there. And I said, yeah, I know. But I said, imagine the barn is not there. And uh, just imagine what the view would look like and what the house would look like situated in that spot. Well, we uh, eventually talked it through and we eventually did buy that property. My, my wife is an incredible realist. She's a detailed person. She, she sees things very accurately. Uh, she saw the obstacle that we had. She saw the barn on the property but I was factoring in one additional thing. I was factoring in the work of a bulldozer. And I was imagining, yes, there's a, de a decrepit barn that's there, but I was imagining what would happen if we just bulldozed that thing down and built our house on that particular site, which is what we eventually did. Helen is a realist, she saw what was real, and I could see what was real. But in that moment, I was also factoring in one additional thing, and that was the bulldozer. There was an optimistic view I had of that property. I could see what it could become. Uh, for a few minutes, I want to talk about this issue of optimism and, and being able to see life in a particular way. Uh, I'm reminded that in Scripture that we serve an incredibly great God. And because we have a great God, we have an optimistic faith. I'm reminded uh, what Paul Cho said, uh, the pastor of the world's largest church over in Korea one day, and people were asking him, why are so many hundreds of thousands of people coming to your church? And he said, the reason they come to our churches is because I preach good news. There is something about an optimistic faith that we have because we have such an amazing God. Now, before I go too far, let me also say this. I'm not a Pollyanna type of person. I know that there are challenges in this world. I know that there's bad things that happen. So I'm not being like an ostrich and burying my head in the sand and pretending that the bad is not there. I know bad things happen. Helen and I have experienced lots of the bad of this world. Uh, we've lost a child. Uh, we came within a hair's breadth of being uh, declaring personal bankruptcy at one particular point. Uh, we had a, one of our children that was heavily addicted to drugs and all the trauma that comes with that. Uh, we've got a family member uh, that was in jail for an extended number of years because of, of manslaughter. Uh, I went through the congregational business meeting from H-E-L-L. -L. Uh, I know what it's like to be on the floor sobbing over situations. I've been hospitalized days on end uh, when I had a serious health problems and I was in excruciating pain. I know that there's bad in this world. And yet there is something about being a, a believer in Jesus Christ that makes me optimistic. Some of you would recognize the name uh, Michael J. Fox of uh, Back to the Future fame. And you would know probably that uh, when he was in his late 20s, he developed Parkinson's and, and it really derailed much of his career, at least for a while. Uh, but recently, uh, Michael J. Fox was, uh, uh, had a bad fall. And as a result of that bad fall, he uh, had back injury and was in excruciating pain. But when he was in the hospital, the, the people that were looking after him, uh, they commented about what it was like to look after Michael J. Fox, and they described him as being an eternal optimist. Well, if anybody has a reason to be an eternal optimist, it's a Christian. To be able to look at the world and to anticipate that there can be good, there, there can be good things in store, to expect things can be better than the way that they are. My favorite verse in all the Bible is Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with power by the hope, by the power of God's Holy Spirit. The reason I like that verse is because it talks about the three things that everybody wants. Everybody wants hope, everybody wants joy, and everybody wants peace. Nobody 
wants to live in despair. Nobody wants to live with sadness. Nobody wants to live in conflict. We all want joy, hope, and peace. But the scripture says that the, if you pursue joy and hope and peace as an end in itself, you're going to be very much disappointed because the pursuit of joy and hope and peace will not result in joy, hope, and peace. Joy, hope, and peace is actually the byproduct of trusting in God, this amazing God that we serve. I've been doing some studying over the last little while in preparation uh, for a series of messages and this one in particular. I did not used to be an optimistic person. I used to be a very negative, very cynical uh, type of individual. I saw the glass as half empty. And sometimes people have asked me, well, what changed? What, what caused you to no longer be that type of a person and instead be the type of person that you are now? And the reality is, it really comes down to a little phrase that's found in Scripture. And this phrase that's found in Scripture, it's not just there once or twice in the Bible. It's literally there hundreds of times. And that phrase is this, but God, but God, or but the Lord, or but our Savior, or but Jesus. It's something to do with but God. And when we look at situations in life, we can either be a yeah, but person, or we can be a but God type person. We can be the type of person that says, yeah, well, this is going on, but I don't have the education. Yeah, but the, the weather is like this, or yeah, the economy is like this. We can be a yeah, but person, and we can look at the world through eyes that are gray and, and skeptical and, and discouraged. Or we can be the type of person that says, but God. Because hundreds of times in the scripture, there's these situations that arise, and all of a sudden, there's this next little phrase, but God, in that phrase. And the focus gets off of the circumstances, and it gets onto the character of God, or the power of God, or the promises of God, or the intervention of God, or the mercy of God, or the love of God. And the, the, it takes us off of the, the bad, and it focuses rightly on who God is. And when we're focused on who God is and what God's power is like and his promises are like, it's in that context that we can have hope and joy and peace. And we can be the type of person that's tremendously optimistic and hopeful for better days in the future. Some of you would know that I teach at a Bible college in New Brunswick. And uh, when I look at our students, uh, I don't look at our students as being turkeys. I see eagles when I look at our students. I'm incredibly optimistic uh, for the future of the church when I look at our students. But here's the interesting thing. My optimism has nothing to do with the students, or actually very little to do with the students. It has everything to do with who God is. My optimism is not in the character of our students or not in their creativity and their abilities and their passions. My optimism is because I know what God can do through people. And I'm very optimistic for the state of the church because I believe in a great God. Now, I'm a visual learner. Um, some of you may know that I'm a, I'm a piano player. I got up into grade nine conservatory piano, which is classical training. Almost got my teacher's license in, in music, but I decided to go a little different way. But I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a secret about uh, my piano playing abilities. When I was taking piano lessons, I can read music. I can sit there and I can analyze the notes on the page and figure out what the chord progressions are and the notes are, I can, I can do that. But when I was a student, what I really liked to do is I would say to the teacher, I'd say, I'm, I'm having a bit of difficulty with this passage in here. Would you mind playing it for me? And the teacher would sit at the piano and do the run or do the trill or do whatever it was that was going on on the sheet of paper. And as I would sit there, I was observing what it was that the teacher was doing and I was learning by observation. The reason I'm telling you this is this. I'm a visual learner and I'm going to do something because I think many of us that are watching right now, you are also a visual learner as well. So I'm going to bring up a series of slides onto the screen. And on the first slide that's coming up, there's a whole series of words. And I'm, there's no test on this. You don't have to memorize them. You don't have to keep them sequenced or anything of that nature. But I'd like you to look at the series of words that are on the slides. And as you're looking at it, would you agree with me that the series of words that you're seeing are all negative words. I mean, they're terrible words. 
There's conflict and terror and tragedy. I mean, there's all kinds of negative words on there. So if you're in agreement that generally, as you look at this slide, there's a lot of negativity on this slide. Now, where those words come from, they come from my study of Scripture. And I'm looking at a variety of Bible verses that I'm going to show you in just a moment. And those words are descriptive. They're either found exactly in the passage or they're clearly implied in the passage of Scriptures that we're looking at. But then the very next words after those phrases or those words say a phrase like, but God, or but the Lord, or but the Savior, or but the Creator. There's something about but God that happens. So now I'm going to bring up four more slides. And the words that you're going to see on the left-hand side of the screen are the exact same words that you just looked at at the first slide. They're all the negative words that you just looked at. But I'm going to take those words that are now going to be on the left side of the screen, and in the center of the screen, it's going to say, but God. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, it's going to show what happened when God intervened or when God got involved or because of the mercy or the grace or the promises or the power of God. And so bring up that first slide right now and just notice the negative words on the left and then the but God in the middle and then on to the right, what happened as a result of the fact that there was a great God that intervened. Let's go to the second slide. Let's go to the third slide. And we'll go to the fourth slide. In every one of those slides, there's all the negativity issues, there's the realities of all the bad things that are happening in this world, but God... And you can see on the right-hand side what happened, how God did amazing things. Now, I'm going to pick out four or five situations that you just saw in general, and I'm going to pick out five in particular and just highlight them. The clearest example of what I'm talking about right now would be the story of Joseph. And if you grew up in Sunday school, you know the story of Joseph, how his brothers beat him up, threw him down in a well. Uh, They tried to kill him. They were planning to kill him, but there was a caravan going by. They pulled him out of the well. They sold him as a slave. He went off into Egypt Uh, for decades. He had no contact with his family. As a matter of fact, his dad believed that he was dead because the brothers brought back clothing that was all bloodied and said, oh, a wild animal killed your youngest son or your second youngest son. And so the family, for all intents and purposes, believed that he was dead, but he was actually a slave down in Egypt. And if you know the story, things started going well, and then he was betrayed and thrown into jail, and he started to rise through the ranks of the prisoners, and then some other bad things happened. And for decades, decades, this guy is languishing in, in slavery and in prison down in Egypt. But towards the end of the book of Genesis, you know how things began to turn around. And there came this day where the the brothers actually had to go to Egypt to get food. And they didn't even recognize that they're standing in front of the brother that they had beaten up and sold as a slave. And you remember the the concluding chapter of Genesis that the, the brothers are now fearful. They now realize that this is the brother that they had betrayed. And do you remember what Joseph's statement was? He said, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good, for the accomplishing of the good that's being accomplished right now, the saving of many lives. There's multiple times in the scripture where there's women who have problems with infertility, like Sarah, and so she can't conceive a child. But God remembered Sarah and her condition and allowed her to conceive You come into the book of Psalms and there's stories of children that are being orphaned and wives that are are being widowed. And the scripture says, but God is the father to the fatherless and husband to the widow. You come into the New Testament that we are in bondage to sin and decay. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. You come into the story of where Paul had his thorn in the side and three times he's pleading with God to take it from him. We don't know what that thorn in the side was. It may have been a serious eye problem that he had, but whatever it was, he pleaded with God to get rid of it. 
But what did God say? But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made, my strength is made perfect in your time of weakness. And on and on and on it goes in Scripture. But God, there is something about the intervention, the power, the presence of God, that even in our darkest hours, even in our times of despair, because we serve such an amazing God, He can take situations and turn them completely around. This concept of factoring into God, into our equations in life, it seems to be a concept that our grandparents and previous generations understood better than we do. Uh, not too long ago, I was actually at a funeral uh, and the very saintly elderly lady had passed away and, and uh, she had lost her husband and yet she marvelously hung on to her faith in God and continued to be a positive influence in, to all those people around her. And as we were sitting in the funeral service, the a pastor that was conducting the service, he said, let's all stand. And he said, we'd like to sing um, the, the, the hymn that was her most favorite hymn in, in all the hymnal. And so we stood and we began to sing those words, um, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That hymn was written by Thomas Chisholm in the late 1800s. And his own story of what was going on in his life, he had been a pastor, and I mean past tense, he had been a pastor. But something happened with his health and his health took such a, a deterioration that he was no longer able to serve as a pastor. And eventually he wasn't even able to be cared for by his family at home. He was so sick. And eventually he ended up in what we would call perhaps today a nursing home. And it was during this time period he was marveling at the, the goodness of God. And we have a record of a letter that he sent to a friend of his. And I'm just going to quote two or three sentences from that letter. And this is what he said. He said, my income has not been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me until now. Although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God, and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care, for which I am filled with an astonishing gratefulness. We have an incredibly optimistic faith because we have such an amazing God. Now I was studying for this sermon and I'm looking at all these phrases in the scripture, but God, but God, but the Lord. And I'm coming to these conclusions that there's all these despairing, terrible situations that were going on and yet, but God, and there, something wonderful could come even out of bad situations. And as I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, boy, I, I got to be very careful that I don't misrepresent Scripture. Is the tenor of Scripture negative or positive? Now, you have no way of knowing whether I actually did what I'm about to tell you. You're just going to have to take my word for it. I took a piece of paper and my pen, and, and I began writing down a series of really negative words that I knew were found in Scripture. And then I pulled out my thesaurus and um, anonyms and I started looking and I said, well, what would be the opposite of this word, these negative words that I know are found in Scripture? And I was trying to find what would be the opposite word. And so what I discovered was this. I took the word, for instance, cursed. I think all of us would say that cursed is a pretty negative word. And I found out that in the Bible, there are 63 times that the word cursed is used. But the opposite of being cursed is being blessed by God. And in Scripture, the word blessed is found 217 times. Three times as many times as cursed, you find the word blessed. I looked at the word bondage. That was one of the words that I wrote down. And I'm thinking, what is the, op the opposite of a person that's in bondage? Well, the, the opposite is a person that's freed. So bondage is found seven times, but the word freed is found 36 times. That's five times more comments about freedom than there is about bondage. I looked at sad and sadness, found 39 times in the Bible. 
and I looked for the opposite. How many times is the word joy found in the Bible? 242 times. Six times as many references to joy as there is sadness. I looked at the word weak. There's 84 times in the Bible that the word weak is used, but the word strong is used 253 times. That's three times as many. I looked at sickness. And then I looked to see how many times was there healing in the Bible. And the word heal is used 190 times. That's 15 times more references to, to the healing of God than to sickness. I looked at thirst. And what would be the opposite of thirst? a person that has a drink. So I look to see how many times is the word drink used or, or having your thirst satisfied. It's 348, 10 times as many references to, to have a person having a drink as somebody having to be thirsty. When I was working on this message, um, a pastor friend of mine uh, in a different province, uh, he, he had no idea that I was working on this message. And uh, he posted something in Facebook and I looked at him, I thought, oh my goodness gracious, what he's saying in his Facebook post just so coincides with what I'm talking about, this issue of but God. And I'm going to read to you what he wrote on Facebook. This is what he said. He said, I'm reading through the book of Romans for my personal devotions, and I'm blown away at the awesome hope we have in Christ. It's tough being a pastor sometimes. Hey, you feel down and discouraged. Read the book of Romans. Wow, what a hope. There is so much hope in Jesus Christ. Boy, that sounds an awful lot like the Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. I started this message by making a reference to my wife and us going to look at that property and, and her seeing the barn. But I want to end this message by telling you something that happened actually fairly recently with my wife. Some of you may know that my wife, Helen, uh, suffers with fibromyalgia very, very badly, chronic fatigue. Uh, she's usually in bed sometime around 8 or 9 o'clock at night and will sleep right through the night uh, trying to uh, get refreshment uh, of her, of her, of her uh, joints and things. She describes her legs and her joints as feeling like somebody's hit them with a baseball bat. They're, they're just sore and, and painful all the time. So she'll get up sometime around nine o'clock in the morning and she'll do her morning things and we'll have lunch. And then sometime very close to one o'clock, she has to go back to bed. And so she'll be in bed from about one o'clock right through until about four o'clock, uh, trying to get her strength back again. About four o'clock, she'll get up and uh, get supper ready and we'll do our early evening things. We have our personal devotions at, uh, at supper time at the table. But sometime very close to 7.30, eight o'clock, she's done. At that point, she's just so overly tired and she, off she'll go to bed. Well, we were at church uh, together. I'm not pastoring right now. I'm teaching at the Bible College. And we were at a church and I knew that she had had an incredibly bad week. Uh, a lot of pain, a lot of tiredness, just a lot of aches and things. And we're standing at church and the, the worship leader was leading the congregation and led us in this song as we were standing there and we started singing the words, I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we shall rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And as we were singing that song, I'm looking towards the front, towards the screen, and we're singing the songs. But out of my peripheral vision, I see my wife who's standing beside me. And I see her put her hands in the air. And she's giving a visual affirmation to the incredible confidence that she has in the existence of God and what God can do. Now, I have no idea whether Helen will be healed on this side of eternity. I know on the other side of eternity, for sure she'll be healed. I know there's a great eternity where there is no sickness and pain and disease and death and temptation. I know that that awaits us. Maybe in this side of eternity, Helen will experience a healing. But she was affirming her belief in the amazing God that we serve. See, that's the type of person I want to be married to. A person who believes in a great God. And that's the type of people I want to see leading our churches 
pastors who will stand in front of a congregation and no matter what is going on around us, no matter what's going on in society, they'll proclaim, but God, there's a great God of power and grace and love and mercy. Worship leaders that will stand before their congregation as they're leading the congregation in worship, they'll point people to the greatness of God, but God. Sunday school teachers who will talk to the kids in their Sunday school class about the greatness of God. Cross-cultural missionaries that will take the message far and wide about the greatness of our God. Christian business leaders that no matter what else is going on around them will proclaim, but God. People that work with our children's ministries and our teen ministries and our single ministries and our immigrant ministries and our elderly ministries ministries, people that will stand up and proclaim what a great God we've got. No matter all the negativity, all the bad stuff that's going on in the economy and around us, but God, there's a reason for hope. There's a reason for joy. There's a reason for peace that can be within us because we believe in the greatness of our God. Who can say but God? It's a man of faith who can say but God. It's a woman of godly character who can say but God. It's the humble business leader who can say but God. It's a congregation of expectant people who can say but God. It's a staff of obedient Christ followers who can say but God. It's the courageous family that can say but God. It's the teen who walks at high school uh, corridors that can say but God. It's the married couple that can hold on to trust who can say, but God. It's the senior who is hope-filled who can say, but God. It's the righteous single person who can say with all confidence, but God. And it's all of us in this room who believe in a great and powerful God who can say with an optimistic confidence, but with God, all things are possible.
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. What a great message that was from Dr. Steve Elliott. I was definitely moved by um, the reminder of how to put all of our focus on what God has for us, even though that we may be lacking, even though that we may fall short, God is able to bring us through on the other end. And so everything pales in comparison to what God can do, because with God, all things are possible. And so I hope that you're encouraged with that. No matter what you're going through, no matter what your circumstances are, they can be turned around because God is in your corner. Thank you, Dr. Steve Elliott. What a wonderful word that was. Well, thank you again, Millican Church, for joining us. And we're so glad that you were able to spend some time with us. And please be reminded that you can join us once again next week at the same time at 10 a.m. for our online worship service that will be live streamed through YouTube and Facebook Live. So please invite your friends to join and um, make sure to join us next week. Let's close with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Milliken. God bless you and have a blessed week.